In order to get the channel going, I want to break down in detail what I've done in all of my entertainment spaces. In this video, we're going to talk about my living room. So our home was a custom architecture and build project that we finished and moved into in late 2013. When building the house, I knew I wanted to focus on technology and entertainment, but due to space and budget logistics, I kind of talked myself out of making a dedicated theater room at that time. Instead, I decided to focus on the living room for entertainment, and we opted for a pretty extensive automation system based on Control 4. So for the living room, my goal was to reserve space for a large flat panel, nicely integrated into the room. Around, along with the surround system, which 7.2 was the, the spec at the time. So design started in here, the, really the section behind me where I'm sitting right now. And I designed this kind of floor to ceiling uh, bump out capable of integrating a wall mounted flat paddle cleanly into the room and providing spaces to put speakers for left center right channels, a couple of subwoofers. And then due to our room design, there really wasn't any place to put surrounds. So the surrounds basically all went up into the ceiling. So I worked with what I had <clears throat> and did everything kind of on an angle design. So the top of the bump out, the, the top speakers were facing down, like shooting directly down onto the couch. And the surrounds that went in the ceiling also had angled baffled. So everything was trying to accomplish focusing the sound to the couch and the main seating positions where we might sit to watch a movie and that sort of thing. My original plan also put all the processing and source components down in the basement where my main rack resides in a storage room. So from behind this TV, we ran a bunch of ethernet, power, speaker cable, and so on to be able to get everywhere we needed to in the room and centralize everything down to that rack in the basement. So for the original system, the first TV that we put in here was an 80 inch Vizio P series, which at the time was only a 1080p. 4K wasn't really available yet. And I chose Triad as the brand for all of our speakers. So there are Triad Silver LCR sixes up top some bronze subs and some additional silver satellites that made up the surround system in the ceiling. So of course it wasn't long before technology started to advance. Within a few years, TVs was updated to a 4K. Um, we actually went down in size, so we moved from an 80 inch HD vis Vizio to a 75 inch 4K Vizio P series, which actually was really a bummer. Those five inches made a big difference in kind of the immersive feeling of the TV in the space and in the living room. Even my young daughter at the time it was a bit of a video file, was pretty bent out of shape when we changed the TV and it got smaller. The other big advancement that came along was Atmos and the idea of immersive audio. So I, I finagled four more speakers into the ceiling in the room over the couch to bring us up to 7.2.4. I was already driving the audio with Marantz preamp and some Emotiva amplifiers from the rack, so that was an easy upgrade to be able to support the processing for those extra channels. So the problem that I had with this setup though is despite all the great equipment, it really wasn't performing to my expectations. <clears throat> the 75 inch TV felt kind of small and the audio especially wasn't really presenting from the right places. We have nine foot ceiling in here and everything was very high. Having all of the surrounds kind of very closely packed together directly over the couch really put all of that sound in, in one spot. And even having the, the front array kind of up above the television despite the angle of the baffle, it really didn't kind of like lock the sound to the TV. It didn't really separate. So <clears throat> everything was really muddled um, and just kind of all crammed together in terms of the sound. So while I was considering some other changes, we finally came to the decision to go ahead and make a separate dedicated theater space in the basement. And we'll talk about that in a future video, but that led to the opportunity to take the, op to take the chance or, or take the action really to refactor the living room. So for a short time, I pulled way back. We just stuck to the flat panel TV in here and I actually just put a sound bar more or less sitting directly under the TV. But I found the sound bar also to be really underwhelming. I kind of went from overdoing the room to kind of underdoing the room. I knew I still wanted a more legitimate level of home theaterness in the living room. <clears throat> and the changes that I made since then have really arrived at a much more balanced performant and what I think is a really great system for this kind of a space. So here's where we're at today with the system. The TV was updated again late last year, this time to an 85 inch Sony, which is the TV that's sitting behind me, which is an X900H. Now we're back to having an even more impactful cinema style feeling, watching TV movies and playing games in the living room. And of course this TV is a 4K, excellent performer, and something I'll be talking about in future videos, particularly the HDMI 2.1 features 
or in some cases lack thereof, unfortunately, in this TV. So we also moved the speakers around. As I mentioned, we took all of the speaker in walls out, and for a little while we had the sound bar, but I actually brought some of them back in. So you can see around me there's, there's four speaker positions here. And what we ended up with was basically a 2.2 audio system. So there's two Triad Silver LCRs and two of the bronze subs flanking the TV. But instead of having those, those left and right channels way up high, eliminating the center and bringing them down directly flanking the TV really improves the soundstage quite a bit and it anchors the sound to the screen better. Um, and so we actually run the phantom center in here. I know there's a lot of debate in AV circles about whether you need a center channel or phantom center is good or not. And I, I might talk about that in a deeper dive in a future video. But for me in this room, the phantom center works. It's excellent. I can sit anywhere on our pretty wide couch. And to me, the sound is always properly anchored to the screen. I don't hear a bias really towards one side or the other. And it's really ideal for this room. Now the processing remains down in the basement in the rack as well taking advantage of the original wiring that was pulled for these speaker positions. Instead, I have a Denon 1600H receiver um, and the Triad subamps basically down in the ramp providing the audio processing and amplification. So moving 1080p video around long distances in a house in the original setup was pretty easy, but moving 4K, particularly HDMI 2.1, is, uh, is a different proposition. You're talking much higher bandwidth and even for right now, HDMI 2.1 switching isn't even necessarily readily available. <clears throat> so I also found one other critical failure mode of having the source equipment downstairs, and that was while sitting up here in the room, any kind of wireless connectivity to the rack was pretty weak. So remote signaling, wireless controllers for video games, they really just didn't work. Despite being relatively close, sitting on our sofa relative to where the equipment is at the rack, is well within the wireless range of, of pretty much all of these types of devices, like the wireless range of a video game controller. But that signal still needs to get through the furniture, it needs to get through the floor, and it's really just not able to do it. It's very unreliable. So to overcome those issues, I changed my focus to bringing the actual sources upstairs and using the space between the TV and the wall. Thankfully, I designed the, the depth of the bump out just enough that most devices can fit back there without too much of a problem. It really enhances the system performance and balances out some of the key design points. We still don't really have the sources visible in the living room. Everything is still kind of hidden and nicely integrated away. So a couple of the benefits of that, right? One, with the devices right here, if you want to use the source remote instead of the Control 4 remote, it works. So particularly like an Apple TV remote or whatever it might be. And again, the video game controllers are now kind of rock solid instead of intermittently dropping or maybe going unresponsive at times. Two, going source direct to the TV ensures better HDMI stability. It ensures the ability to use the HDMI 2.1 bandwidth and features. And there's no really additional need or problems to worry about switching or transforming the signals like HDMI to, to Ethernet or HD base T or some other type of transport, um, HDMI transport. And then three, if something does go wrong with the source device, it's a whole lot easier to just get up to the couch, walk up to the TV and power cycle or turn something off rather than having to go downstairs, go to the storage room and, and do something actually in the rack. So the key to mounting everything behind the TV are some great products that I found from a company called Hide It Mounts. And I'll probably go into more detail on those in a future video as well. But essentially, all the sources are stably and low profile, nicely flush mounted to the wall behind the TV with the Hide It Mounts. So to complete all these connections as well, and to keep everything updated again towards the HDMI 2.1 standards, I recently pulled a couple of new cables from the TV down to the rack. First was a, a fiber optic cable. If you, if you have to go HDMI long distances nowadays, really fiber optic is your best way to go. And so I pulled a 33 foot RUI Pro cable um, from the rack up to the TV, <clears throat> which I was using for a little while for some PC gaming, but I'm actually not using that cable at the moment. The main one, though, is a 35-foot Toslink fiber optic audio cable. That's really the key to the setup. So all the sources go into the TV. Audio comes out of the TV via that optical cable down to the rack and directly into the receiver. Since I only have a 2.2 setup in the room, I don't need to send multi-channel audio. I don't need to send Atmos signals down there. So optical audio is perfect and has enough bandwidth to be able to do the job. Optical audio can transmit two-channel PCM losslessly from one source to another. 
So even if the Atmos signal comes into the TV, say from the Apple TV, the TV will reduce that down essentially to two channel PCM <clears throat> and send the rest on its way. So I'm maximizing the audio quality still with essentially lossless signaling because I'm only using two channels. So it also makes whatever switching I need to do in the room super easy because the TV is the only thing actually ever switching or changing inputs. The receiver just needs to turn on and sit on one input mode for TV audio because anything, else, anything that's connected and going through the television goes through that single cable, one input on the receiver. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I also have four ethernet lines behind the TV, which for now has been enough for all the sources to be wired. Um, most likely I might end up adding uh, probably an eight port gigabit ethernet switch behind the TV um, as I want to cover more devices and I'll probably be hooking more things up based on making content for the channel. And it's usually always best to avoid using Wi-Fi for fixed devices. Anything that spends its time streaming any video or downloading in the case of a game system, wired is always better than Wi-Fi. So in my experience, most living rooms are pretty tough to fit multi-channel surround sound into. And after having built a dedicated theater space, it's really clear to me just how compromised a living room might actually be. But that said, you can still have really excellent audio and video in your living room if you're honest with what the room can do and build with the right balance for the room itself. In this case, for me, it was still was a pretty large flat panel display, but bringing the audio down to 2.2 and not worrying about Atmos and immersive audio and that sort of stuff. So amazing performance, excellent audio, a clean installation, and trying to minimize some of the complexities was my goal for this space, and I've been able to generally meet it. Even if you can't build in quite so cleanly in your room, a sizable flat panel flanked by two nice towers with good bass performance with that TV sitting on a nice AV cabinet is still really ideal, right? Particularly if you, if you might also still have a larger screen multi-channel space in another area of your house. So even with having our dedicated theater room, I find myself quite happy watching content, even including movies in this room. And this is where lately we've played the majority of our video games, both for myself actually and for the family. Despite the theater having the larger screen and the superior audio, this room has a few things the theater doesn't in terms of being more integrated into our everyday living space, being closer to family that might also be around and doing things rather than being away in a separate room, particularly in the basement. And I'm very eager to try to take advantage of the HDMI 2.1 features of the TV as HDMI 2.1 is really more of a game enhancing technology than a video or say movie enhancing technology. I hope to have a lot more on that in some future videos as well. So what's new and what's next in here? Well, one thing, I made a cardinal mistake in technology when I bought this TV. I still really like it, but I bought a TV that basically promised features and wasn't offering features. And you never quite know when those features might come. So, so far to date, Sony's kind of failed to deliver on the HDMI promises of this television. I wanted to be able to do 4K 120 Hertz gaming and unfortunately, if you do that on this television, it remains kind of a blurry mess, as well as variable refresh rate and some of the other HDMI 2.1 features still not have, having been enabled, despite the TV having been on the market now for like close to a year. <clears throat> so I'm hopeful, hopeful Sony will deliver on those promises. Um, in addition, we use Apple products for most of our personal tech, and I personally feel that the Apple TV is the best video source streamer around. So I recently updated those both in this room and in our theater, the 2021 models. And I've been debating how much I like the new Siri remote versus our kind of, you say, more expensive or more advanced Control 4 remote. And I plan on breaking that down potentially in a future video as well. I'm also trying to make some gaming platform decisions. I've jumped between PC and console gaming quite a few times in the last few years. And I once again find myself stuck between the two of them. Right now, I actually have a Nintendo Switch sitting behind this TV I've got an Xbox Series X and a PlayStation 5, uh, again, sitting in the boxes. But I've also recently built a very, very powerful gaming PC. So one of the, one of the near-term videos, I plan to kind of break down that PC build and really in the future of the channel, get into some of the debate about why you might want to game on a console or a PC and what are the real differences and such between those. I also have one major bug to squash in here. It's been a thorn in my side for a while. When the base hits hard, these in-wall subwoofers can shake that that energy transfers out and we hear this rattling sound just outside kind of the, the one of the windows over there. I'm pretty sure it's one of the gutters and so I need to get out there on a ladder and, 
and figure out what exactly is going on. Hopefully something's just loose or I need to screw something down and basically secure that gutter and end that rattle. Nothing takes us out of content or me out of content. Sitting in this room watching a movie and then hearing that, that exterior rattling come in. So I plan to talk about all those future changes. Really what I want the channel to be is kind of the, the, the evolving debate and analysis and so on of, of different things that I do and things that I'm tweaking with. The only thing that's constant for me in technology is change. So thanks for watching. Um, next up, I plan to do a theater overview, which I then intend to move into a series of essentially home theater building uh, episodes where I kind of go through all the different facets of you know, what did it take to put together a dedicated media space and the different elements and, and structure and such of each of those with a focus on what I did and why I chose what I chose and so on. And then I'll also get into the, the PC build episode and, and a whole lot more to come. So thanks for watching.